Okay, good afternoon. I'm Ted Snyder. Welcome to Yale School of Management. Uh, our mission is to educate leaders for business and society. And welcome to all of you uh, to the 2019 Gordon Grand Lecture. Uh, established in 1973 to honor Gordon Grand, who graduated from Yale College in 1936. He was uh, president and CEO of the Olin Corporation. Uh, this lecture uh, is a forum for dialogue between students and business leaders. Past distinguished guests include Janet Robinson of the New York Times, Danny Meyer of Union Square Hospitality, Ray Kroc from, of course, McDonald's, and one more food uh, uh, person, Victoria Mars from Mars Incorporated. Um, let me now introduce the 2019 Gordon Grand Fellow, Mr. Mark Allen. Uh, Mark earned his JD from Yale Law School in 2002. Uh, after YLS, he went to clerk for recently retired U.S. Supreme Court, Anthony M. Kennedy. Mr. Allen's current position is president of Boeing International and he's a member of Boeing's Executive Council. Uh, Mr. Allen is directly responsible for Boeing's international strategy and corporations, uh, uh, excuse me, corporate operations outside the U.S. He oversees 18 regional offices and key markets. He's also responsible for developing business and industrial partnerships throughout the globe. Previously, Mr. Allen served as president of Boeing Capital Corporation as Vice President of Boeing International, as President of Boeing China, as Vice President for Global Law Affairs, and as General Counsel to Boeing International. In fact, uh, Mark is the person who developed the international legal practice for Boeing. So given his deep expertise, um, he's an expert on obviously international business, global regulation of business, international legal and policy matters, he knows, for example, everything anyone could know probably about the World Trade Organizations and the kinds of disputes they have. Um, outside of Boeing, he is a Henry Crown Fellow for the Aspen Institute, member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. He is a member of various boards, <laughs> uh, including the International Justice Mission, the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum, the Atlantic Council, and the U.S. UAE Business Council. I'm going to skip your undergraduate stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing personal, right? <laughs> well, just, you know, leave that aside. Um, for the past two days, uh, Mark Allen has engaged enthusiastically, energetically with students here at the School of Management, at the law school, with Yale College, with faculty. Um, we have uh, as he mentioned when I, uh, we were walking up, the, we put him through his paces. But now, now we're here for the, the, the main event uh, to continue the conversations on the industry, geopolitics, and maybe some more on your own professional development. So please join me in welcoming Mark Allen back to you. So. Uh, my colleague David Bach is the person, perfect person to uh, moderate this conversation. Uh, as many know, David is a political scientist. Uh, as Deputy Dean, he's the person who has the job that's most analogous to Mark's. Uh, he directs the school's executive MBA, the Master of Advanced Management, the Master of Management Studies. He leads global strategy primarily through our engagement with the Global Network for Advanced Management. He catalyzes curricular innovation in the area of global business, guides online education activities, and oversees Yale Center Vision, uh, a good portfolio. So to get started, we're now going to have a one-minute video about Boeing, and then Mark and David, the floor is yours. So the video. <clears throat> Pressurized. 30 
seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Wow. I know. I was kind of the same way. And, and you don't see this. We have a screen at eye height right here. I was like right in there. Um, I still get excited. I, it's super excited. exciting. I don't even know how to get from there to what we're supposed to talk about because this was so much fun. That was the point. That was the point. I mean, it is such a fun and cool industry. So thank you, Mark, for being here and for sharing over the past couple of days, you know, thoughts with all of us. And, and you know, Ted, thanks for the kind words. I thought you had asked me to do this because I, I love planes and I just want to make sure you appreciate it. This isn't merchandise that um, Mark uh, snuck in here. This is my prop. Okay. So this is my plane because I love aircraft. Uh, and some of you know that both my dad and my sister are Lufthansa pilots. But those of you who are experts will recognize this is the special edition that brought the German national team home from Brazil in 2014. So it combines two of my passions, which are um, global uh, travel and aircraft and, and sports. So leaving aside my passion for your products for the moment, um, The Economist recently, um, this is my other prop, sort of declared globalization over or at least transformed and argued that we're entering a period of globalization, And so as somebody who is very much at the uh, frontier of all of this, has a first row uh, seat, um, front row seat, what do you see when you look out at the global economic and political landscape? Oh, well, I won't uh, be able to jump on board just yet with globalization. Yeah. We'll see. But what I, what I do see is a massive inflection point. Mm. I mean, I just feel as if the, the, all the data and all the experiential trends show us that there's more dynamic change happening right now than we've seen in the last 40 and arguably 70 years since the, uh, the post-World War II order was constructed. And it, it, it just sort of coming to your political science background for a minute, I mean, it's, you know, it's a number of things, but you know, the institutions of the world are ineffective and just aren't up to the challenge anymore. <clears throat> uh, you know, Dean, you mentioned the WTO. We've been in front of the WTO for over 15 years with our subsidies case against Europe and have yet to get the final dispositive ruling. That's a system that doesn't work. When was the last time the United Nations was able to really play a significant role on a major matter around the world? It's been tough. Um, obviously things like IMF and World Bank are greatly challenged by the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank and the BRI out of China. All the global institutions are, are shaken in that sense. At the exact same time that that's happening, you have these trends of nationalism and populism, which lead to things like Brexit, which have significant economic consequences. Um, and you know, at the same time, you also have obviously a greater lean in governments of the world towards authoritarianism which is starting to shake some of the question about what is a market economy, which affects firms like ours. So the, these global trends, <clears throat> the inefficient institutions, and all of it happening at a speed that you never could have predicted before, right? So more things happening, broader ripples than before, and companies and governments having to react to more with less time to react. And so the, the, the idea of speed and the nature of speed in the business community and the government community is a factor that's also radically transforming this. Uh, and I, I think those things are all overlapping. They're, they're in many ways even mutually reinforcing. And so the, the change that's being driven is, uh, is something that we're going to have to come to grips with and we're going to see a new order emerge from it. It won't take five months or five years. It's a 15 or 20 year project. And, and whether or not civilization is in fact right is going to turn on what the architecture is at the end. Does the world hold together and trading remain a global unified frame of experience? Or do we start to see pulls and divided realities, fragmentation across the world order? So for us as a business, we're, we're trying to figure out how do we help 
in that environment because we obviously vote in favor of a global market <laughs> and the chance to participate really broadly. Well, you're in some ways connective tissue in this world that is being pulled in, in different directions. So talk a little bit about sort of the the global footprint of, of Boeing, right? Sure. You're, you're, you're an iconic American company, but one that by on so many measures sort of defines what it means to be a global enterprise. You know, we came of age, we're 100 years old, we came of age at the same time that the U.S. economy was, of course, coming of age through two world wars. Um, and it, now, if you look at us, we're still 75% of our people in the United States, um, 150,000 people totally. And yet we do have people in operations across 65 countries. We have customers in 160 plus countries. Um, I remember that 75% uh, employee base in the US produces a $100 billion revenue stream of which 80 plus percent is exported. So we're of course still the nation's largest exporter and that's both on the defense and the commercial and the space uh, businesses. Um, it, we are, I think you use the word iconic, I think that's fair. I think Boeing's definitely an iconic company, an iconic US company even. And one of the things that's meant is that you know, one of these factors in the changing world has been the perceptions of the United States. And when the United States over the last several years has started to back away from this idea of keeper of the commons, it leaves companies like ours having to now redefine our role out in the world too. And I think a real focus for us has been building global scale and depth, establishing company to country relationships that can really uh, create ballast, a counterweight, even as the, the role of the U.S. recedes, we have to stay forward deployed in order to access those markets, access technology, access talent and ideas, and really pull the best of the best from that. So, so, so how do you do that? So round numbers, 80% of your employees, you said 75, but let's make it simple. 80% of your employees in the U.S., 80% of sales outside the U.S., very much seen as an iconic U.S. company, but very much a global footprint, and you're serving clients globally, you're accessing technology globally, but a company that I think a lot of people here in the U.S. think of as, you know, it's ours. It's an American company. It's an American icon. Certainly policymakers acting that way. How, how do you balance these, the sort of need to to be global, to operate globally, to, to, to build relationships everywhere, while at the same time, um, you know, managing the expectations here at home? Uh, as with every industry, the first step is to listen to the customer. Mm -hmm. Right, to start very carefully understand what the customer's need is, what the requirement is. And you know, take the United Kingdom as one example. Um, the customer there on the defense side, of course, is the government, the Ministry of Defense. And one of their needs is for their defense industry to partner with them, not just to sell them product. And so you know, for us, there were years where we were not in a position to sell into the United Kingdom. We had to always sell through a UK company. Mm -hmm. And it was only until the point that we invested in the UK and built up our operations there that we then became allowed to sell directly to the government. And what we were able to do is be able to show that a win abroad is a win at home. That by investing in the UK, developing content in the UK and people in the UK, and being able to sell into the UK, we created a lot more opportunity for our engineers and our scientists back home in the United States. And so we tell the story of a win abroad is a win at home to both sides, to the US government and to the UK government. And I, I think our ability to stand uh, is kind of a fulcrum between two economies, demonstrating the mutual benefit on both sides is part of the unique positioning that companies have to play in the current moment that we especially get to play because of aerospace. So if you've had to do that dance with the UK, the US and the UK, I would imagine that it's more challenging when you're doing it with, say, a Russia or a China or another place. So, so does it work the same way? You just demonstrate there's benefit to both sides in the end the US benefits when Boeing is more successful, say in, in, in China or elsewhere in the world, or does it get more complicated with countries that are perceived as rivals? Hey, you're gonna hate my answer, and the answer yeah. is yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, full stop, end of yeah. story. Um, it, it really is about uh, demonstrating the mutual value. Mm -hmm. And so we've had the exact same conversations actually about operations in China, operations in Russia. With, uh, with the U.S. government, and we demonstrate the math, and the math, uh, the math is pretty strong, and, and it really does stand on its own. Right, um, and so, um, you know, in that context, you were saying before how you know, U.S. foreign policy or, 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 or the U.S.'s standing in the world as a whole has been shifting in this, in this context of uh, these institutions haven't just become 
weaker on their own. What, what seems to be happening, and, and these are my words, obviously, I don't want to put words in, in your mouth, is that the current administration seems to be accelerating perhaps their, their decline or, or, or pushing them to the side rather than making them more, more relevant. How, how, how do you deal with that when, when you often get linked to whoever happens to be the, the, the current U.S. administration? The, the, the current administration was very clear, uh, first during the campaign and then during the early days of the administration, that they wanted to put you know, partners and friends, uh, as well as others, on notice that the United States thought there was a free rider problem in the world. Yeah. And, and that's what an awful lot of that pullback and restructuring and the, and the rhetoric has been about. It's been about you know, putting people on notice to change what was perceived as a free rider uh, environment. Uh, you can, though, look at uh, institutions like NATO, for example, um, which have, you know, despite the difficult rhetoric at the beginning, have actually managed to respond pretty well during this time. There is, in fact, more investment than ever from Europe into NATO at this time. The Secretary General has done a wonderful job of holding the interests of the members of NATO together and keeping them oriented on, on the singularly defined missions uh, and maintaining U.S. support for NATO. So there, there's clearly been uh, rhetoric and real-world you know, outcomes. And I guess, I guess if I step back and look at it, I would say, yes, the, uh, the, the, the current administration took a tack that was different than before and that was unexpected by partners and allies around the world. But frankly, what's been addressed in this, you could call it restructuring, was something that was structurally going to happen at some time in some way. Uh, the, the fun of history of geo, geo strategy and geopolitics is that ordinarily geography, culture, technology, you know, some of these big elements uh, are, the, are the key drivers of an outcome that will happen, irrespective of exactly when and exactly who drives. And I think that's true here. So, so you spoke before about how a company like yours and other leading companies, at least that's what I, what I understood, um, then have to step up and, and, and have to sort of play that role of reminding people of the mutual benefit of integration. Um, does that mean you, you need to have a vision of what global governance ought to look like? I mean, it sounds like you've been somewhat dissatisfied, say, with the WTO, with some of these institutions. I mean, what, what is the limit to the role that you see a company like yours play in, in, in sort of shaping the global environment in which you yeah. compete, if there is a limit? Well, I think it's very important that we tell our story. Uh, and I think that if we, if we don't, then policymakers sometimes miss the intersections of interest mm -hmm. that would otherwise allow for you know, cross-pollination across cultures and nations. Yeah. And so telling the story and being very proactive about the demonstrated value of what we do as industries is important. Uh, aviation is just one example, relates to about 3.5% of global GDP. So you take away aviation, and that's not just the building of airplanes, that's all the travel and tourism that's attached to it, that's the movement of goods, cargo, transport. Small fact for you all, about 1% of goods traveled by air, they represent over 30% of the value of goods mm. that are in transport. So you can see how aviation plays an outsized role in economic movement and trade. Um, it, back to how we have to respond as a company in the face of some of these changing dimensions. Uh, you know, the, we had an example I'll share from a few years ago where there is a, a relatively public um, dispute between Boeing and Canada. We challenge subsidies that, uh, that one of our uh, industrial counterparts, Bombardier, had received and that they had used to dump airplanes into the United States market. And it was an airplane that was just starting to get into the space of competition with our 737. So we challenged it at the International Trade Commission. And, and Canada reacted by pulling back, in a way, defense business from us. Mm -hmm. and, and that was an, that was an example where, look, I think a company's appealing to an established tribunal to get a ruling on legal grounds uh, was reacted to in part because there was an impression that this was part of a broader U.S. economic strategy. It wasn't. It was simply a company that had an issue that had not coordinated with anyone else and that was seeking redress from a, from a court of competent jurisdiction. But that sense was really a sense of skepticism of our intentions. Right. And I think you do see that the changing role of the U.S. has led to a change in many's view of U.S. intentions, and that can sometimes be of company intentions. Yeah. So it becomes incumbent on companies to be on front explaining what we're doing, 
building partnerships, investing in other environments around the world for this win-win situation, uh, and in part to overcome that skepticism. Yeah. I was in, uh, in China a couple of weeks ago at, at Yale Center Beijing and had some conversations there with business leaders and with journalists. And the conversation very quickly came to, to Huawei. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that people there had a hard time understanding was that it wasn't a given that the White House had called the Canadian authorities and asked for the arrest of the CFO of a company that some US companies have had disputes with. Right, there is sort of a perception of the way business government relations might work in other parts of the world that is then imposed on sure. you know, the way. How do you deal with that? I mean, you know, you, you, it's one very of, separate entities, right? Yeah, well, one of the great uh, lessons for me of working in China for those years at Boeing China yeah. was being able to recognize how much of the filter we all wear. Yeah. And so as American companies, we try to understand what's happening and, and pick your market. Yeah. Uh, but we, we always are referencing what we would expect based on our US experiences mm -hmm. and vice versa. Yeah. So as, as another market is looking at the United States, they are connecting dots. They are making inferences based on their own understanding of their market. Mm -hmm. And you know we need more of what this school is doing in terms of the global, uh, the global opportunities, the strategic partnerships with other business schools, so that students go and work and learn in other environments to be able to take off some of those filters. Or if you can't take them off, at least realize you have them on. Right. That's the very first step. Right. Um, much of our conversation has been about how you're dealing with the turbulence right now, but you're making decisions in the enterprise, you know, looking what, 10, 12, 15, 20 years into the future, right? What's the, the average, if, if I were to order a plane today, Five to seven years. Five to seven years, and if you got me to the top of the queue, it's what, four to six? I mean, yeah, we it doesn't get much faster. Three, sure. Okay. So, <laughs> so, we'll talk afterwards. Yeah, you know, I good. see, I see yeah. a Boeing business yeah, jet yeah, in your there future. There you go, all right. <laughs> this is working great, all right. All right, so, so five to seven years, and of course, new model development, we're talking, what, a, a decade? Um, 12 years. Or 12, or 12 years. So, so, you have to make decisions right now about resource allocation. Um, when, when we seem to be witnessing this sort of, you know, maybe it's not snow, slow globalization, but it's sort of, it, it seems like a step change in, 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 in this context. So, how, how, this is the opportunity. All right. I mean, because because at the end of the day, yeah. right, if, if there are two potential outcomes, fragmentation yeah. or a more unified global trading system, it will be those leaders, nations, and companies that are the glue that help unify it, that will be in position to best service that market. Tremendous opportunity right now uh, to position ourselves by building the kinds of solid company to country relationships that will give us another 50, 70 years in markets. I mean, if you look around the world and think about where we've been, we arrived in Beijing in the form of a 707 flown by President Nixon, Air Force One, when he went to see then Chairman Mao. He didn't fly himself, country. did he? Why at the, at the, at the yeah. front? No, he had, he had qualified individuals. <laughs> um, but you know, he left there with an order for 10 airplanes yeah. in the back of the airplane. Uh, and, and that was a starting point. So that's now almost 50 years of history. Mm. And during that time, Boeing in the United States, the FAA, hand in hand, uh, played a significant role in helping develop air transport in China. And that's the reason why. It took us 40 years to deliver 1,000 airplanes to China. We delivered the second 1,000 in six years. Right, because of that partnership developing the market. And if we, can, if we can hold on to that kind of partnership, not just with China, but with the world, and we can be a global industrial champion, not just a US industrial champion, there's a tremendous unlock of opportunity that's in front of us. So, so in other words, if, if, if things are stable, uh, business isn't easy, but it's easier than in these turbulent times. It does mean that companies that have the capabilities that have strong leadership, that have the kind of people who are globally connected and, and enlightened critical thinkers. This is, this is their moment, this is the opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. because you know, 20 years from now, if I could rattle off, let's say, six to 12 countries for you, if you know, 20 years from now those countries look at Boeing as their champion for aerospace, the United States will still be one for sure. Mm -hmm. But if that list of six to 12 also does, 
the implications for what we will be able to do from a research and development and innovation perspective, from an investment perspective, uh, what we will do together in terms of creating efficiency of, of supply lines, uh, of really uh, taking advantage of uh, differentiation in our skill sets, right? So comparative advantage as a core that we are able to manage inside the bounds of the company, not just outside the bounds of the company. Um, there's an explosive uh, opportunity there, and, and that's what we're all trying to get through to. And so you're right, this moment becomes very important because who are the individuals? Because all of this comes down to relationships. Mm -hmm. Relationships are what you know, yield that, uh, the, the, the oil that can, can lubricate conversations and create trust. Mm -hmm. you know, when, I always come back to marriage. Yeah. It's, the best, it's the best analogy we all have. And in marriage, when we believe the best in our spouse, yeah. you know, a, 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 a particular word is a good word. When we believe the worst, that exact same word is a terrible word. It, whatever the word is, however it's conveyed, what we believe about the speaker matters. And it's the same thing in terms of negotiations between countries and companies. Mm -hmm. And until we have a set of leaders that are positioned to believe the best, to know each other, to really understand dynamics, context, and situational awareness, uh, we'll be challenged. I, I want to open it up for questions in just a moment, but I want to ask you about one other um, uh, issue that, that you know, we think about a lot here, and, and we spoke briefly about yesterday evening. Um, so when you, we've talked about global challenges, we talked about um, you know, loss of credibility in institutions uh, of, of global governance, we've, we've talked about economic nationalism and populism, you know, quite a bit of it fueled by the kind of uh, income inequalities that are uh, associated with uh, you know, the impact of, of, of trade and globalization. And then there's the other sort of big global challenge, which is, um, climate change and sustainability, and I know one of the statistics that, that you shared is that, what's the percentage of people on the planet who haven't flown in an aircraft? It's less than 20%, have, 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 flown, flown. have flown. Okay, so, so you know, that's incredibly exciting, the idea that we could all become sort of closer as a community, you know, travel more, be more connected, more understanding, and, and yet, um, you know, our, our our planet is fragile as it is, and air travel, travel is, is, is a fairly small fraction of global emissions, but my understanding is a fairly quickly rising one. And so as you're dealing with all of this and, and you're promoting you know, growth because it's good for jobs and it's good for connectivity and it's good for, for, for research and development, we're dealing with the environmental side of all of that. And, and I know you think about that hard, so, so talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I think every industry has to think about what are the strategic constraints to growth. Yeah. And there is undoubtedly, for every transport industry that's out there, whether it's you know, ships or cars or planes or trains, there is the question of will emissions regulation become a growth constraint? And so the good news is I think that focuses the mind of all of industry. You know, we were one of the leaders early on that led the sustainable biofuel development uh, uh, programs. And, and we have we have found sustainable biofuels that are regionally based out of all kinds of feedstock. Um, you'd, be, you'd be shocked. We just, we just had a, a, a flight recently out of the, I think it was at Etihad Airlines out of the Middle East. Our partners there had created this as a fish farm, takes in seawater from the Gulf, feeds these sea weeds, as it were, which the fish eat on. Fish grow, get big. They harvest the fish, turn into feeds to food for the population. Uh, those weeds that are growing, they then can pull out once they reach maturity, squeeze them, get oils out, and turn it into Jet A and fly your airplane. Hmm. It's an amazing, you know, full loop, closed loop uh, system that you know answers all these different needs: energy, food, and it's working not on uh, water because you're in a desert, but on the seawater that's plentifully plentiful and available. Um, that's just one example, and I could give you another 20 where we've worked with partners all around the world figuring out what works in their region, what's sustainable. That has happened in part because we understand that the, the industry has to drive emissions down. We, uh, we have driven them down. Uh, if you look at the figures, we are far and away the most advanced transportation industry that has reduced uh, emissions on a uh, passenger per kilometer mile basis. And we've made commitments as an industry uh, through ICAO, which is part of the United Nations, to reduce a, a carbon emissions by the year 2050 by 50%, which you, know, you, you say to me, well, Mark, that's the, you know, 50%. We need a lot more than that. Well, that's 50% from a measure in 2005. And it's in an industry that's been growing at a CAGR of 8% for the last five years, and that we project to grow at 5% through 2050. 
So when you think about the growth that's implied, a natural you know, per capita today emission standard would get you to, to have the total emissions by 50, by 2050 is extraordinary. But we have to do that because that's part of what will enable growth and will keep the industry uh, you know, bringing to bear the economic prosperity that it currently contributes to the world. So we're very focused on it. Three out of every four of our research dollars goes into emissions reduction technologies. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it's propulsion or aero structures or controls or air traffic management. It's a lot of, a lot of investment and a lot of money in that. Uh, and we will be at the forefront. I'm very confident of that. Do you, do you need a global price of carbon for that? Or can you do it without it? So the, uh, the, the ICAO structure will ultimately lead to trading schemes. Mm -hmm. uh, Europe introduced a trading scheme. I think it was in 2007 or 8, yeah. uh, which bled over into a regional trading scheme implemented around 2011 which started, frankly, to fracture the airline industry. And there were, there were some pretty uh, tough fights. Well, there were concerns the about sort of fleet age, right? And sort of the airlines that had older fleets then felt they'd be at a competitive disadvantage? There was some of that, but the, the biggest fight, frankly, was uh, non-European airlines flying into Europe. Yeah. We're going to avoid the tax. Yeah. And European airlines who are subject to the tax, yeah. and they flew out. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, you had an uneven playing field on the economics, which led to, ultimately, the global discussion at IKEA, which is the right way to address this. The, the regional frameworks don't work in our business. It's a global business. Mm -hmm. It needs to be managed as such. This is why, back to where we started, it is so important to create a unified global structure that can manage trade issues like this. So another area where, as a global company, you have not just a responsibility or an opportunity, but a, but a need to an work, an interest in working with government to create you know, global governance yeah, mechanisms. You, know, you, you saw the video. Think about space. Yeah. There is so much opportunity in space that will be harvested over the next 25 years. Space is going to be very difficult to solve alone. Uh, in space, anything that is a technological advantage is also fairly understood as a weapon. Because think about it, the two main things you care about in space are how to maneuver and how to sense. And if you can maneuver something in space, you can run into something else in space. And if you can sense in space, you can gather intelligence. These are fundamentally security functions. And so we're going to live in a world where either uh, nations look at evolving space capability as a threat and respond to it by believing the worst, or create mechanisms that allow coordination, that allow them to believe the best, and as a result, open up things like a mission to Mars. It would be very difficult, I think, for one nation to go to Mars. I think a multilateral uh, grouping could. Uh, and so this is going to play out fast. This, you know, this is not 2050 stuff. This is 2030 stuff. Let's open it up for a first round of questions. And if you'd please just uh, briefly say your name, uh, what part of the university or the community you're from, that'd be great. Please. Hi, Mark. Thank you for, com for coming here. My name is Chaim. I'm a second-year MBA. I'm curious to learn more about your career path, kind of moving from being a lawyer to being corporate law in a firm and then moving to the business side. Uh, I'm a lawyer myself. I left law and kind of, you know, did something else on the business side, but not in the same firm. And I feel like in the same firm, it was kind of regarded, oh, you are the lawyer. How can we put you in business? So if you can talk about that. That's great. Um, you know, I, I start with the premise that it's about really understanding yourself. But I'll tell you a story. So when I was in second grade, my mother took my sister and I out to, a, it was summertime, she took us out to an uh, arts and crafts shop. And she wanted, she was trying to bring out the, you know, the artistic side of Mark. And so she said, you know, buy whatever you want, go home and enjoy it. And so I said, well, I'd love these stencils and spray paint. And, uh, and so we took those home. She had no idea what I was going to do. And I proceeded to walk out the front door and go door to door through my neighborhood, offering for $5 to paint those vertical sidewalk numbers for the addresses for my neighbors. And I cleared about 200 bucks in an afternoon. <laughs> it was 1980, and I had a fro out to here, so I was just using sex appeal you know, to sell. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 a, and a can of spray paint. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, the rea and that kind of sense of creating something for value has just always been a part of my story. I've just always loved business. I've always loved creating value. Um, and at the same time, my father's a political scientist, and we sat around the dinner table, and we talked in second grade about Montesquieu. Uh, and th that was a huge, and is a huge part of who I am. And so for me, the real question was, how was I ever going to integrate these two? And I believe for quite a while that I wouldn't, that they would be separate tracks. So when I came out of college, I actually went into business first. I thought to myself, I'll, I'll do business first. It'll kind of be the early hobby. And then I'll go be, you know, for my, my calling, my career, I'll go into law. And I thought government as well. 
Um, and, and that's what I was doing. So I did five years before law school. I had a wonderful uh, business set of business experiences. You know, I, I learned how to build PowerPoint models with the best of them. You know, PowerPoint, you know, Excel, just doesn't matter. I can run it and do it. I understood everything about a balance sheet or a financial statement. So I got the business strategy experience in those first five years and then made the shift to law and thought to myself, okay, great set of skills. I've got the muscle, but now professionally, I'm going to focus somewhere else. And, and I thought I would do that forever. Uh, and the, the switch back to business was very unexpected. Um, but because I had the muscle, when I ultimately went in-house to Boeing as a lawyer, I think that, uh, I think that you know, mentors and people I worked with saw the way I was moving in relationship to the business, not just the law of the business. And so they started to ask me, hey, would you be interested in? And once those questions started to come, that ultimately is what led to my winding up back on the business side. Uh, which I also love, but wasn't looking for. Um, and you know, someday I may wind up back in court trying cases. Who knows? Um, I try to keep an open mind, and, and uh, you know, to me, that's that's a very important part of uh, of career progression. Uh, having the the right risk uh, adversity, you know, turned down. Don't have the risk adversity too high. You have to be willing to let go of things, good things, to go do other things. And so that's I'd, I'd, I'd offer you that, which is know yourself, and then be willing to let go of things, take a risk, and, and see what comes. But follow that passion. Right there. Hi, thank you for your time. I'm Alex, also second year MBA. And it seems to me that firms like yours are subject also to unbundling pressures, like whether you're you know, challenged on the commercial side by Skype or smaller drone manufacturers on the defense side or you know, space startups like Elon Musk or Richard Branson. So I'm kind of curious how you see unbundling playing out both at the global yeah. scale and domestically and how it factors into your thinking. It's a great question. I will start off with just a reality which is it's very hard to do the kinds of things we do in a startup mode. It just, it just is. The integration of an airplane, um, the development of a major satellite system, um, a major defense platform, they take a certain scale that's very hard to replicate outside of the environment of one of the big, big players. Having said that, uh, we are paranoid about a future reality where what is right now hard to replicate you, know, you see that scale slide, and more of what we do becomes easier to replicate because of unbundling. And so certainly, we think about GAFA, you know, the Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazons of the world as strategic competitors now uh, in a way we did not five or 10 years ago. Um, we are investing a significant amount in disruptive mobility, you know, autonomy, and personal, personal flying vehicles, le electric propulsion. Uh, we're building prototypes. We actually flew the first PAV, personal autonomous vehicle, uh, our first PAV uh, last week for the first time. And, uh, and this is something that, you know, it, it will not be a product you ultimately find in a store, I don't expect, but it's the learning and it's the muscle development and it's being at the edge of that technology and inside that indus dis industry space that's gonna help us disrupt ourselves and not watch somebody else do it. So we're, we're very tuned in to the risk of this evolution and our goal is to get there first before others do. Um, I, like, I like our chances. Re remember, uh, every single day, 12 million people go 30,000, 40,000 feet up, and every single one has to come down safely. It is a, it is a grave tragedy whenever that doesn't happen. And that, that level of seriousness uh, that we place in the legacy of aviation as a secure environment has to be ported into this new environment. And I think that's ultimately a, a massive uh, competitive advantage we have because of the way we think. It's a, it's a cultural reality for Boeing. Um, it also means we know how to work well with regulators all over the world. And so we have right now either Boeing directly or through some of our, uh, our, our, our uh, subsidiary partners, we have programs that are at work in places in the Middle East, in Australia, in Switzerland, here in the United States, in different states. Uh, they're, they're, so we're testing the bounds from a regulatory perspective, hand in hand with the regulator, using our experiences of demonstrating to them how we prove out new systems uh, to make sure that we stay in front as we prove out new systems here. Because you know what? Those airplanes, when they are PAVs, those are going to be commodities. We understand that. And so you know, we have our own theory of what's not going to be commoditized. And we're working really hard to, to make sure we own that. Let's take one more question. Um, where do we go? All right, back there, please. Hello, my name is Dan. I'm a first year MBA student. 
Can you speak uh, to the future of unmanned aerial systems and what Boeing is doing to posture for this potentially significant change to the aviation industry? Mm -hmm. We just launched a company called SkyGrid and it's a joint venture with another company, Spark Cognition. Um, and Spark Cognition is a company we own a minority interest in and have been partnering with for several years. They're an AI company uh, based down in Austin, Texas. And we're bringing artificial intelligence into the autonomous air traffic management space. Air traffic management's a bit of a misnomer. We don't think uh, this is reflective of what we are used to thinking about as air traffic management. When we start talking about urban mobility, we think this idea of a sky grid, or, or I, I like to call it the, the uh, AIOS, the air operating system, right? Um, this, the AOS, is, is ultimately what we need, something that integrates every aspect of aerial movement in a close-in urban environment, and frankly, then that later ties to every other step in the transportation system, because someday, you're not gonna to wanna to think about the steps. You're gonna to wanna to pull out your phone right now and say, I wanna to get to Cleveland for dinner right now. And you want this phone to give you the solution. And that solution may be a short Uber ride to a spot where EV a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, electrically propelled, will fly you to an airport, put you into a plane, move you to, uh, to Cleveland, right? With the exact same capture on the backside. How the consumer interfaces, how the air traffic management for the eVTOL, how all those systems with autonomous vehicles are networked and worked together and, and synced, that's, I think, what the future is going to be about. And so we're positioning ourselves by making sure we're at the front edge of that sky grid. Uh, as it gets developed. And, and that's just, just to give you a little bit of a sense. Obviously, I mentioned the vehicles already. Those autonomous vehicles we're building um, will be an important part of the opening, but they're not ultimately the whole game. Uh, and I, I will say that you know, from a company perspective, you saw a little bit on the video, you know, we right now are the, the leader in drones in every category except for one. So we make an underwater uh, autonomous vehicle that's the size of a small submarine. We make autonomous vehicles that can go up and live in space for years by themselves. We make the small in situ uh, drones that you saw there that the military uses for uh, surveillance, you know, command and control uh, and, uh, and uh, battlefield awareness. The only thing we don't do is the, the large drones that shoot things, but everything else you know, we, we lead on. In fact, one of my favorite programs is something we call QF-16. Um, and this is being taped, so I'll be careful how I describe it. But uh, uh, we, there's another uh, defense company in the, in the space that makes a different airplane called the F-16 not a Boeing airplane. And when those airplanes uh, get old and tired, uh, the Air Force uh, buys them and gives them to us, and we turn them into autonomous uh, drones. So the Air Force can then use them for target practice. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the hardest things in, in business, and you see this time after time, is striking a balance between what is sometimes called managing the present and inventing the future, right? Because you need, you need different people, you need different, you have different metrics, right? You're, you're dealing, you know, with all of this turbulence that we talked about in your existing business, and and yet you're working on projects that are so different, or at least they sound to to the outsider so different from the things you're you're known for. How how do you how do you organize that? How do you how do you set incentives for, 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 for folks? How do, you, how do you manage talent accordingly? How do, you, how do you build teams? How do you do that? It's really hard. Uh, we were just having a conversation not long ago as an exco about this very question. And, and <laughs> basically, the, the question that went around the table was, OK, you know, around this table, who owns X? You know, when three hands went up. Mm. We said, okay, wait a second, let's have a conversation. Obviously, three hands are deeply coordinated, but, but what are the lead and support roles? And you have to be willing to take that time to flush that out because, you know, large organizations are dynamic. They are human. Um, competencies reside all across the enterprise. They're, they're, nobody has a monopoly on the talent needed to solve some of these problems, and we need to draw on all the places. And if you had come into our company, um, let's say, 15 years ago, you would have found a company that was very siloed. In fact, when I started, which was not long ago, I started in 2007, so 12 years ago. When I started and met people at the company, I said, hi, I'm Mark, I'm new. They would often introduce themselves by their heritage company. 
Because remember, Boeing is a product of, a, it's an amalgamation, a consolidation of US aerospace. They'd say, hey, I'm Bob, I'm a heritage you know, Douglas guy. Or hi, I'm Susie, I'm from McDonnell Aircraft. Or hi, I'm, I'm Jack, I'm heritage Boeing. And remember, the merger was you know, the late 90s. This was a decade after the merger, and you still got that human behavior. Today, that doesn't happen. No one would ever introduce themselves that way today. One Boeing is real, and it's one of our principal strategic prongs, one Boeing. Sounds simple, but it's meaningful. And so how do we incentivize the team? We have a one Boeing score. We did away with individual business unit scores because we were seeing that that behavior was persisting too long. So we said, okay, one company score. Um, we, we made out of our way and go out of our way to this day to reward the people who step forward and take on responsibilities that are outside their natural lane in a way that's making some other part of the company successful. I was doing a regional talent review in Southeast Asia recently. I had an engineer in Australia uh, who was on the commercial side who had played a big role helping a defense program, which are doing some really exciting clean sheet designs down there. And, uh, and, and this engineer, you know, didn't, it, it wasn't part of his job jar. His boss didn't ask him to go do it. He just knew there was a problem. He said, hey, can I help? They pulled him in, he helped. And so as we were doing the compensation review, we said, okay, we need to lean compensation to this individual because of what he's done. He's demonstrated the one Boeing behavior. So I think that's the first thing. You have to have a culture of a whole company that wants to see the enterprise success, optimizes at the enterprise level, not inside the business unit or functional levels. And then the second thing is you do have to change people. You have to make sure that any old mindsets are, are, are taken out and you have to bring in that talent that's excited and eager to change and transform. And I think our chairman, uh, Dennis Mullenberg, has done a great job of leading the way on that. And is there, how do you hedge against the risk of sort of taking your eye off, off they're not legacy businesses. I mean, they're very much you know, still the future of the company, but perhaps a little bit less exciting because of the lead times and the complexities of some of these you know, newer uh, innovative product lines that you were talking about. Yeah, we have to remind everybody, and I think you know, videos like the one we saw earlier are an important part of that, yeah. that there's just nothing that's boring about aerospace. Yeah. If, you, if any of you have had the chance to go to where we build the 737 in Renton, Washington, you'll see a footprint that's producing today 52 airplanes a month. And it is a third the size, a third the size of the facility we had about 20 years ago when we were producing 22 a month. And everybody said 22 is the max. There's no way we could ever build more airplanes than 22 in this space. So how do you get from 22 to 52, and we're going to 57 later this year, in a third of the footprint? Right? You do it because uh, you, you've got incredible engineering, business management, program management systems that are enabling this acceleration and flow time, that are thinking through new inventory and just-in-time structures, that are learning around the world from people like Toyota and the automotive industry, uh, and are not giving up. They're trying to solve really hard problems. And, and so if you have a team that's excited about solving hard problems, you know, then you get them inspired and motivated uh, on that mission just as much as the person who's working on the, the personal autonomous vehicle. Got it. Got it. Let's take another. Yeah, please. Hi, my name is Temi. I'm a first year MBA. Um, obviously, we're at EOSOM, and our mission is to educate for business and society. So my question is around um, Boeing's societal impact beyond CSI, especially in the current environment and in the locations that you are in as offices and units. Yeah. Um, it's a big world, and so you're gonna have to just kind of settle into your chair now while I, get, I can tell you what we're doing. Um, you know, we, we, take, we take very seriously being a member of the community where we are. Uh, I, I think today, you know, corporations have a very different view of stakeholder interest than probably you know, a few decades ago from a US perspective. It's a much more globally minded perspective. Um, but for us, we invest in so many different ways. I mean, the first thing is successful businesses really are win-win. I mean, this idea of a win abroad is a win at home. When, when we win in India, it helps our UK business. And that creates jobs. And jobs, and prosperity, that's the first order of interest in most, most nations we go into. Never, ever forget that. It's so important for you when you're running a business that those cars in the parking lot, those are families. You know, those are, those are holiday meals where the dinner is provided for. That's a roof over, over people's heads. You have to really deeply internalize the weight of what it means to lead a large organization and have thou literally thousands and thousands of people and families dependent on you making wise decisions. 
Now, the, the second thing we do is, uh, you know, I'll say around STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. We're big investors in, in STEM efforts with children from early, early elementary all the way up through high school and university. And so wherever you go around the world, you'll find us as a leader in programs. And we've taught hundreds of thousands of children in China, millions of children, you know, in the United States. Um, we've had, you know, thousands of university uh, students in the UK have been a part of our programs. And so I could tell you a story everywhere. And so that, that impact through students and STEM is really important to us. We also invest pretty heavily around veterans because of our defense and security profile. Um, and so we work with Wounded Warriors and Invictus Games, and we're building housing for veterans in Korea. You know, in Spain, we provide scholarships for the children of, of veterans who are lost in action. Uh, you can pick examples everywhere because they're just ways we want to engage around veterans. And then there are other things we do around uh, just what we call the interests of our home. So whether it's the environmental activity we do in a lot of places, um, or whether it's uh, working on healthcare in a few environments, we choose things that are specific to the community. You know, we make sure to show up in a way that matters to the community. Some of the small things we do um, are sometimes, to me, the most impactful because we can sometimes be a really you know, positive force in a local community just by how we operate. And one example uh, I, I like to use is, is very important. In Saudi Arabia, we are one of the first uh, companies there to hire females into the company. And we now have a finance department that's about 85% female. And I tell you, they're running circles around the incumbents that were there, and a lot of them are now gone, the incumbents. There's a reason for that. You know, just the, the dynamicism, the fire, and the vigor, and the energy. Um, and, and that's fun, because that has now changed the environment. Uh, we've seen a real groundswell in uh, female employment in Riyadh. That's, that's neat to be able to be a part of that. Uh, and I'm walking down the halls, and one of our, uh, one of our offsites in California a year or two ago, and I, am, I come face to face with one of our, our, our female leaders who says, Mark, I don't recognize her because the only time I've seen her, she's been in a baya. And here she is in you know, jeans and Western clothing. And I just like, it's just one of the, your, your, this, the hair on the back of my neck kind of stands up and tingles that we get to be a part of massive cultural change that's happening around the world right now in good ways. So, so in, the impact uh, for us you know, comes in so many different ways. We talked a bit about the environment. Uh, we, we have been a part of impact there. Noise in communities, where we have reduced noise significantly. This airplane, I think, reduced noise by about 40% from the prior version. Significant uh, upside effect for communities. So it's a constant part of how we think through our responsibilities. Um, we going? Yeah. Hi, my name is Udit. I'm a second year MBA student. Um, I want to know, is there a business that you say no to? And what are some of the reasons for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, let me first kind of start on, you know, this comes in different levels, right? Our commercial business and our defense business. Uh, on, our, on our defense business, you know, what we do is gated by a very rigorous control system, the US trade control system and the US alliance network. And so we don't have to pick and choose uh, in that business so much as uh, we, have, we have a national interest from the US perspective that guides us and where we start and follow. Um, we certainly choose particular parts of industry to be in and out. So there are certain products you know, that, that we don't build that we could have chosen to be in. So it, it ends up factoring more into product, in, uh, product participation decisions than it does market decisions most of the time. Um, having said that, there, there are some times, there are some moments where you know, you, you, you'll never see it and I'll never talk about it. Uh, but where you know, we may not be selling uh, a particular product or service to a particular uh, customer for whatever particular set of reasons. But, but I want to be very clear. Th that is a profoundly difficult question. Th there is no easy answer, and there are no fast answers. Because in our business, you, you heard earlier about the cycle time, 12 years on products, right? backlogs of five to seven years. And, and frankly, um, histories with nations that ordinarily date in the 50 to 100 years, depending on the nation. And so you know, the Boeing relationship with these markets tends to transcend governments and individuals in a way that's very important to keep in mind. We don't want to swing you know, with the fashion. We want to be consistent and steady and in that sense conservative, because it's ultimately the right thing to do in our industry, for all of our employees, for the customer, et cetera. And so, so we're very thoughtful about those. They're very hard decisions. Uh, and, we, and we take them extraordinarily, extraordinarily seriously. But we keep our eyes up on the horizon for those decisions. We have time for one more question. 
um, all the way in the back. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Adriana. I'm a first year MBA here. Um, you talked a little bit about like the responsibility that you have on your shoulders as an inv individual leader, and I know we spoke a little bit about how Boeing makes decisions about what business to go into. I'm actually curious just about your own mm -hmm. ethical compass and your own kind of moral compass, and I'm curious about how you make decisions as an individual on what you when is like no go, no go. Great question. Uh, when I was when I first got to China. I was in China for three and a half years in Beijing. When I first got to China, I was interviewed by one of the local uh, Chinese papers. It was a standard welcome to the market kind of an interview. And the very last question I was asked was one I wasn't prepared for. And, and the question was, you know, Mark, uh, how do they frame it? it was something to the effect of, Mark, what's the most important thing in your life? I was like, well, wait a second. You know, this is a business interview. What do you mean? What's the most important thing in my life? Um, and I gave some uh, some ridiculous, you know, answer uh, that I'm sure sounded perfectly plausible at the time. But it wasn't the most important thing in my life. And and I I left that moment and I thought to myself, I gotta come to grips with this. And the most important thing in my life is my faith in Jesus Christ. And so I had to figure out how to speak that as a representative of the company in an environment where talking about faith wasn't naturally going to be an easy or first order thing to do. But it actually was a really healthy experience for me because kind of failing in that moment gave me a chance then to reflect and to, and to spend time really thinking about how to talk about my values and what I hold dear. Uh, and, and that has allowed me to really own that base of who I am and what I value and prize most. And, and so, you know, when you ask the question of, you know, what's my, you know, core, you know, center for, for my values? Well, my faith is my core. Uh, how does it express itself uh, inside, you know, my work uh, at the company? Um, I, I hope it does every day, but obviously it's not something I talk about every day. And, you know, if you hadn't asked the question, I never would have said anything. But you've asked the question, and I'm going to share all that I am. And I think that last point's really important. You know, sharing who you are as a leader is fundamental. If you're not willing to share yourself, you'll be an ineffectual leader. And so you have to have the courage to be rejected for who you are. And if you can take that kind of courage, turn into fearlessness that drives you in whatever you do, you can have success in a way that's very consistent with what I'm sure are the principles that you hold most dear to yourself. So just understand that there's courage that's required, that it's not easy, that you will fail, and sharing yourself, but the more you do it, the more strength you will find in it, and frankly, the more fun you'll have. And so that's, that's just a little part of my, my story. So, so I was going to invite you, as we wrap up, to share some words of wisdom for soon-to-be graduates um, entering uh, professions, and, and, and you did that incredibly eloquently already, you know, because you asked a terrific question. Um, but. You know, people are looking at, at this sort of world of, of, of turbulence, you know, opportunities all around the world in different sectors. Uh, we're, we're not in the world of the graduate anymore where it's like, listen, plastics. You know, that's, <laughs> so, 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 plastics, <laughs> that's, plastics. That's it. You know, that's your winner. So, Thermoplastics so, somewhere. There, just there you go. <laughs> so, so, you know, advice? What should people be looking out for as they're thinking about, you know, questions like the one you asked? You know, I've always thought of myself as this, but I'm pivoting to something else. What, 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 what matters? Um, I'm going to share with you advice I got from somebody else uh, because I love this advice, uh, and so that's that's I have to multiply it out there. Uh, an early mentor of mine had done a lot of venture capital work, and uh, he had invested in probably over 500 companies. And I sat down and I asked him. I said. You know, what have you learned? If you could distill one lesson from investing in 500 companies and you know, losing a lot of money, making a lot of money, what's the lesson? And he said, it's very simple. He said, you could send me you know, a great plan and mediocre people, and I will lose money. Or you can send me a mediocre plan and great people, and I will make money. And I've internalized that for myself in terms of job decisions as trying to have a sole you know, decision point, being people, people, people. Who am I working for? Who's working around me? Who's working for me? And if I can put myself in a place where I've got great people in those dimensions, it's always a great experience. And I'm going to tell you, it's a lot easier to say than it is to do. 
because title, money, geography, these things become really hard to ignore. Remember, strategy is the art of choosing what great thing not to do. So if you really, if you believe my advice, you would find a way to set those more to the side and just choose based on people. And, and I think that means that whatever industry you go into, if you go into it with the right people, you're going to adapt. It might be a terrible plan for plastics you know, in 2020. But if you go into it with the right people, you're going to wind up in thermoplastics, partnering with some incredible engineers I know in the Netherlands, and being a part of the aerospace supply chain. And it's going to be sad, and Boeing's going to have to come buy you out because we didn't do it ourselves. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's the exciting opportunity to understand that great people will always pivot, will always create rich, rewarding experiences, and will always make you better when you're working with them. Go work with people who make you better. That's, that's the best advice that I can give that, that I once got. Great. Well, you've given us lots of advice. There are lots of things that I learned in this conversation. And you, know, you talked about when you win abroad, you win at home, which is a very elegant way of, of getting through some of the noise and the turbulence, and perhaps most importantly, the kind of zero-sum mindset that seems to have set in. You were talking about opportunities and turbulence. And these aren't your words, but what I heard was, you know, when things are easy and, and, and stable, you know, anybody can succeed. But this is a time when, when those who have that ability to connect, to look around them, to, to, to engage, to build personal relationships, to take risks, to be innovative, will thrive. And then I think you, you said that, you know, smart people are going to be drawn to difficult problems. And, and you talked about the environment. You talked about the future of, of, of aviation as, as a set of really interesting problems that will draw good people. And, and one thing that I uh, keep is how many times you said fun. Like, this is fun, and that's fun. And, and, and fun is so incredibly important. And yes. So I want to thank you for, for your passion and, and, and for the fun that you brought to this conversation, for the work that you do, uh, and most importantly, for, for sharing two days, precious days with us and educating all of us uh, about, uh, about your work. Thanks, thank you David. so much. I really appreciate pleasure. it. Thank you. Great.